That was a rallying cry. Good morning again. Good morning. Well, if you weren't awake already, about to get awake with this story. A story I have not told yet, but uh, back when I was in the Navy in 19, I can't remember. There, <laughs> I took a trip. I took a trip to. Uh, I took a trip like you just take trips in the Navy. They make you go there. You <laughs> sign the dot and you go. Uh, we, uh, we had deployment. I was put on deployment with the rest of my squadron. We went to Sigonella, Sicily. Anybody ever been to Sicily? Sigonella, okay, great. Um, now that you haven't been there, I can tell you it was a magical land of unicorns and fairies. You know, you've never been there, so you don't know. I know. But anyway, just kidding. Uh, it was a, it was a uh, place that was, the uh, temperature was a lot like Florida. Um, really hot and whatnot. But anyway, while we were there, um, we had to find a few things to fill our time. And so one of the things that uh, the guys out of the, uh, the parachute uh, um, part of our squadron did was they constructed this amazing gadget. And it was this parachute material that was a pocket about that size, about, I don't know, 10, yeah, about 10 inches by four inches. And it had these little bitty handles. And then on those handles, you had these uh, bungee cords. And these bungee cords went about four feet or so. And there were like two bungee cords on each handle. So you had two bungee cords on the left of the pocket, two bungee cords on the right of the pocket. And then at the end of those bungee cords, you had a little handle that was constructed right on, on the side of that. It took three people to operate this amazing piece of, I guess you could call it machinery, had a few working parts to it. Now on the back of this pocket, there was this little bitty handle. And what you did was you got three guys. One guy would stand over here with his hand on that handle. The, guy, the other guy would, hand, would stand over here with his hand on this handle. And then there was one guy in the middle, he would have his hand on this handle. And what they would do is that they would, each one of them would take about four or five steps, the one on the left to the left, four or five steps, the one on the right, four or five steps, and they would keep on going until it was totally stretched out as much as it could be. And the guy in the middle would take that strap right in the middle and back up as far as he could go. And then somebody else would fill a water balloon filled with water and put it right in the middle. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? Now, where we were staying in our barracks, uh, it was about uh, six stories. And all the Navy guys were in their, in their barracks. That was me included. Six stories. Whole lot of rooms. And right next door to us is a parking lot. And then a smaller building, always clean, always nice, always pristine, two stories, and it was filled with Marines. <laughs> now, the Marines were known for keeping everything 4.0, outstanding, no dust on them. And this one room that we could see from like our fourth or fifth floor, we could see we were looking down on there they were, cleaning out this one room. And they cleaned it so well that here's what they did to clean. They would take everything out of that room, and they would, furniture and everything, and they would pull it out, put it right in the parking lot, and then they would go in there, and they would mop, they would wax, they would bleach it the whole nine yards. Because that's what you do when you're a Marine. You make sure everything is squared away. It's what you're supposed to do in the Navy, but we were a little bit more lax. Because we were spending time doing important things like <laughs> building water balloon launchers. <laughs> That's what you do. So here they are. And we're sitting there just watching them, just waiting, biding our time. Because we can do that in the Navy. We, we spend a little bit of time just watching people. And just sitting there. We do a lot of recon and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what we were, I was in the squadron, so we did a lot of flying and 
you know, we, we look out over the ocean and whatnot. So we're sitting there watching them. So about an hour later, they get done cleaning their room, and just when they put the last piece of furniture in, we got the guys ready to go. One guy on the left, one guy on the right, one guy in the center, and another guy that filled up the water balloon and with water and put it right in the middle and stretched as far as they could. And one guy, me, just sitting there watching it going like this, just smiling through the whole thing. The left guy went to the left, the right guy went to the right, and the guy in the center backed up, put that thing in there. <laughs> that water balloon just went straight, and I'm telling you, from the fourth floor, in a doorway, you've got to be a marksman extraordinaire. <laughs> and that water balloon just flew right in there. I mean, like, right in the middle, as if we had a laser focus right in the middle. And it went right in that room, and you could hear the water. And we just watched that thing just explode, and all of a sudden, here they come. All of them out of that room, just ah! I am not lying when I tell you this. Those guys came out, I don't know if they had weapons, but I, I know that they came out, and one of them was literally climbing up the outside of the building, doing this number. The rest of them were going up the stairs. And you know where we were? We were inside our rooms going, oh man, I need to study this Navy manual because it's so important. The rest of us just sat there. They never caught us. We never got in trouble for it. But I know this is that to this day, there are about three or four Marines out there that will, their lives were changed forever on that <laughs> Now, how do I work this into the sermon? <laughs> we, we have been going through this, <coughs> this message, this, uh, this series about the, uh, the church and who we're supposed to be. I have an immense amount of respect for the Marines, even though I was a sailor and I was in the aviation part of it. I have an immense amount of respect for the Marines. My dad is a Marine. Once you become a Marine, you never end your watch. You're always a Marine. I have an immense amount of respect for Marines. And what I'd like us to be able to do as a church, those who have been saved from their sin, who call Jesus Lord and Savior, I want us to be like those Marines who will stop at nothing to make sure that the job is done. And when we look and see what this word has to say to us, this is how we need to be approaching it. We need to be looking at it square dead on and making sure that at the end of our watch, at the end of our life, we can go to God and say, this is squared away in our lives. We've met every corner. We've cleaned every benchmark, and we've made sure that at the end of our lives, we can come to our heavenly commander in chief, and he can say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's what we want to do. And so this week, we're going into the third part of who is the church within the church series. This was only supposed to be one message, you understand. But it's turned into three parts. So if you've missed any of it, please catch up. I'm going to do a jet tour through the first uh, part of it for the first two weeks. That way, if anybody has not been here or who has not heard, you can catch up like that. But then go back. I encourage you to, to listen to the messages because I think it will encourage you and strengthen you. And uh, so here we go. As you have your word out, Matthew 16. Matthew 16, chapter 13 through 18. And we're using that for our text again. And the word says this. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, on, and on this rock I will build my church in the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. Shall not prevail against it. So again, we have this uh, rallying cry from, from Peter, who outlines what the church is going to be about, who the church is. And Jesus says that he will build his church. And all the attributes of the church come from and flow from Christ, as we said last week. We have to remember that Christ is the head of the church, the body, not the pastor, not the board, not the elders, not the anybody. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Amen. And whatever the church does, they do it because Jesus is telling us to do that. And again, it's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about our personal opinion. I'll wait to do it whenever. No, it's what Jesus says in his word. And that's what we do. And we discovered in these past two weeks that the church is built upon Christ. You know, in verse 18, and we said this the first week and the second week, verse 18 talks about Peter being Petros, a piece of rock, a piece of rock. And then also in verse 18, it talks about a rock later on. It says, Petra, a mass rock, a large stone. <coughs> and Peter's confession about that rock on this confession from verse 16, you are the Christ of the Son, the Son of the living God. On that massive stone, who is Jesus Christ, on everything that the church is and is going to be, it's on that. That Jesus is going to build his church. Not on Peter. Not on a sinful man. Although Jesus uses people. But on the very fact of Jesus. Who he is. And what he does. Jesus is going to build his church. On that stone. On that large bedrock. We also found out that the church is called the ecclesia. Can everybody say ecclesia? Ecclesia. All right. We are the called out ones for God's purpose. Nobody loves me. I don't have anything to do. Well, guess what? If you're in the body of Christ, God has called you out. And he loves to take his kids by the hand and show them, this is what I want you to do. Because that guy over there... He's not going to be able to do what you can do. And I need you to go do this specific thing over here. He loves to show his kids exactly what they need to exactly do. Because it all fits into his purpose. And so the church, we are called out once for God's purpose. We also found out who the church is not. The church is not about the me culture. The church is not a social club. The church does not get wisdom from the world system. The church's function is not to entertain or to be entertained. I think one of the main things that we've talked about too, and I caught myself in the elders meeting this Wednesday messing up on this point, but I mentioned that we don't go to the church. We don't drop things off at the church. We are the church. And I was telling the elders that, Okay, I'm going to the church, to, and I caught myself. I stopped myself and said, no, we are the church. We're going to go to the campus. We're going to go to the building to do such and such. If we get into our mind that we are the church, and that the church is not a, a brick and mortar type thing, and we can understand, we can understand that God has a purpose for us. He'll use brick and mortar, I'm sure, but he has a special purpose for us. So we are the church, and the church is a Christ-honoring people, not a building. Christ redeems souls, not brick and mortar. Okay? 
We're a Christ-honoring people. We're not a building. And we also discovered who the church is. The church is a people who have been reborn and redeemed by the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. As, a, as revealed by the Bible to worship, enjoy, yes, I said enjoy. How often do we enjoy God and his presence? <clears throat> but as revealed by the Bible to worship, enjoy, love, and obey him forever. So who the church is, we are redeemed people. We're God worshipers, we're Christ-centered, we're God's ministers, we're gospel proclaimers, and we hold to God's word, the Bible. It is Holy Spirit-inspired. The Bible is God-breathed. We also learn that we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we follow Christ. We also learn that uh, we, we have and show Christ's love for others. Kind of like Child Evangelism Fellowship that we were talking about earlier today. We want to be able to show the love of Christ to the children. We seek and institute and impart godly leadership. We do that in the secular society. We do that within the boundaries of the family. We do that in our businesses. We do that for the church, of course. We have a set way of doing things in the church body otherwise it's going to be chaos nobody wants chaos but we always look to the head of the church jesus christ we get our 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 marching orders from him and then we go and do and we be and we also talked about last week about discipline and a healthy church let's <clears throat> not a healthy church disciplines it does and for more talk about that, please go to last week's sermon because we talked about church discipline and the Bible clearly explains that in Matthew 18 and I told you the story I put myself on the chopping block last week I told you the story about one of the times that I got disciplined many years ago about speaking out of turn and in the wrong way uh, towards a, a lady and um, the executive pastor, her husband, called me up to correct me. And that was the first step of Matthew 18, is to go to that person, talk about them with their sin, and that person is supposed to repent. If that person does not repent, then you take two or other witnesses that can verify that story, and you go and talk to them about it. And here's the problem. We don't want to go and talk to people because it, it's a very difficult thing to do. But if we're in within the church, if we're in the boundaries of love and grace within the church, that's what we do. You know, the Bible says the, the wounds of a friend are faithful. Or you could read it like this, faithful are the wounds of a friend. We don't want to flatter each other, but we want to be real with each other. If you're hurting my feelings, if you're actually in a process of sin, we need to have a talk. And if I'm doing the same thing to you, we need to have a talk. And that's healthy. Would you rather bury your head in the sand and not get things straight? Or would you rather, hey, let's take the Band-Aid off and let's examine this and get it cleaned out and put on the hydrogen peroxide or whatever you use and let's get things done. Let's get forgiveness going. Let's get restoration happening. And that is the point of church discipline is to be able to talk to each other and have restoration happen so that as a church we become Christ-like and nobody in the church ever has been perfect except Jesus Christ Amen. so knowing that we're not perfect knowing that we're going to sin uh, against each other we need to expect that sometimes we're going to get our feelings hurt and that's not okay but what is okay and what's healthy is that we get this worked out and Matthew 18 does that and a healthy church does that. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have written it in his word. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. All right. I know that's a hard one to say yes to. I agree <laughs> with, but it is in the word. So this week, we're going to continue with part three of who the church is. So our first point would be this. We value and hold to sound doctrine. We value and hold the sound doctrine. Some of you may be going, 
What in the world are you talking about? What's this doctrine thing? Well, out of 2 Timothy 4, 2, and 5, it says this. Preach the word. Paul tells his, his, his friend Timothy, the younger Timothy, he tells him, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap unto themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, Timothy, and fulfill your ministry. So Paul here gives Tim, young Timothy some instructions. He says, preach the word. But there are two, two words here that I want to concentrate on. Preach the word. Here it is. Out of 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 5. 4, 2 through 5. And in verse 2, it says, teaching. With all long suffering and teaching. The word for that is didache. Didache. And it is the act of spiritual instruction. It's very important that you catch this. Didache, it's the act of spiritual instruction. Then in verse 3, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The word for that is didaskalea. Didaskalea. And it is spiritual instruction. So let me read this back so we can all understand this. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and the act of spiritual instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound spiritual instruction. So you go ahead and you go through the act, the actual doing of spiritual instruction. Teach these people. Teach them. Feed my sheep. Jesus said to Peter, feed them truth and the spirit of love and long suffering. Don't expect people to get it automatically. Don't have a spirit of judgmentalism. Wait, be patient. We're going to get it. If you're like me, it takes a little while to get truth through your head, through your spirit. But we're going to get taught truth. This is called doctrine. For the time will come when people will not endure spiritual instruction. They will say no. And by the way, they're going to go and get whatever they can. So they're going to go on YouTube and they're going to get the positive reinforcement uh, new age type of teaching that makes people feel good. And there's no work on myself at all in accordance to submitting to Jesus Christ, my creator. But it's all about me. And people are going to say, forget the teachings of Christ. Yes, Jesus was a nice person, if I, I guess I believe in him. He was a nice person, but that's all he was. And the things that he had to say, I'm going to pick and choose out of what he has to say. I'm not going to take his whole word for, for gospel truth, no. This is the spirit in which Paul is saying this. There's going to come a time on this earth where people are going to say, no, forget about it. Because it's not cool enough. It's not good enough. It doesn't fit my lifestyle. certainly doesn't fit my time schedule to do what Jesus says. And my personality just isn't that way. I cannot bow the knee to Jesus Christ in my daily life. And this is where we're at as a culture. Watch the news. That's all we need to do. Flip through your Facebook thread. Tell me, tell me the Bible's lying. Here at Christ Community Church and other Bible teaching churches where we honor God and we honor, what are we doing with the word of God? where we honor God and we honor the word here, we're going to hold and value sound doctrine. Amen. Amen. 
It's going to hurt us. It will. Truth usually does. I do not like to be told I am wrong <laughs> from the word of God. Because I look at it, here's a mirror. It's God saying, hey, you need to get this part of your life <clears throat> on track. The Holy Spirit is here within you. He resides within you. He's going to help you to do that. You're, you're going you're gonna to get people around you to hold you accountable, to ask you the tough questions, to help you out. The church is going to help you do this. But we're going we're gonna, to, I love you enough to, to change you. Because God says it's all about me. So here, and for the, the person who believes in the word, we're going to value and hold the sound doctrine. We're not going to go according to what tradition says. Now, there are some traditions that are biblically rooted, and that's awesome. And we need to stick to that. But we're going to hold the sound doctrine. Not to tradition, just for tradition's sake. Not because it feels good. We're going to hold the sound doctrine. We're going to value that. And look, for me as a teacher... Giving out false or wrong doctrine is like giving someone the wrong directions. And I don't want to do that. I'm going to be held accountable to God one day in eternity. And he's going to say, Scott, what in the world did you do with my word? First off, did you obey it and give honor to me? And second off, did you feed the sheep in the way that the Bible says? And I'm going to be held accountable. And I need to do the, the job no matter the reaction. And that's okay. And living false or wrong doctrine keeps us enslaved to continue to live selfishly. Because when I'm selfish, I'm enslaved to that. Tell me I'm lying. Honestly, when a person is selfish, they're enslaved to that. Nobody wants to be like that. Nobody does. Nobody wants to be like that. We want to be set free. Jesus came to set the captive free. And so sound doctrine empowers us to please God. He renews our minds to become more Christ-like, and he invigorates us. Sound doctrine invigorates us to love people in word and in deed. This is what sound doctrine does. Right spiritual teaching. And I wrote it like this. You live what you know, and you are what you practice. I'm sure it's been said many times before in many different ways, but it's the truth. You live what you know, and you are what you practice. So as a church, what we need to do is we need to start practicing for heaven. Because in heaven, we're going to be complete in Jesus Christ, like fully realized. Not like fully realized, but definitely fully realized. I know it's hard to see on this earth. Positionally, Jesus says about his kids, you are, you are holy in my sight. But we need to live what positionally we really are in heaven. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. So we're going to stick to sound doctrine, whether it's here from this pulpit, in small groups, or in Sunday school lessons, whatever it may be, we're going to stick to sound doctrine. Also, the church is a people who are spirit-led, who are spirit-led. Romans 8, 14 says this, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Those people that are actually doing the work of the ministry, those people that are actually obeying Jesus Christ, those are the people that are the sons of God, daughters of God. And our earthly journey is now a direct result of our heavenly position. In other words, what God has made us is our position in heaven. That we are children of God. He wants us to start walking that out here on earth. And Galatians 5.18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You are not under the law. You're not trying to uh, please God out of have to. You're pleasing God out of <clears throat> wanting to. And so you have a willingness to be led by the Holy Spirit. And that is a supernatural response because of what Jesus has made us inside. Put it like this. If I become born again, I'm going to be doing what Jesus wants me to do. 
Let's put it like this. Our car, car that I have, that Sherry and I have, takes uh, that super amazing, super duper unleaded gas. If I put like the regular unleaded stuff in it, it's gonna perform really bad. So whatever is in that car is gonna make it go the, the way that it's supposed to go if it's good gas. But if it's not good gas, it's, in other words, it's gonna do whatever's in it, okay? In the same way, if, if God is living in you, then you're gonna do what he wants you to do. And you're not gonna do it be, be, begrudgingly, you're gonna do it because you want to. Now, this is where we come to a big word, the doctrine of sanctification, spiritual teaching of sanctification. This is a step by step by step by step process. Justification, this is another doctrinal word. The doctrine of justification is where I was justified, where I received forgiveness from Jesus Christ and I was made right with him positionally. Now, for the rest of my life here on earth, I go through the process of sanctification. I am walking out what Jesus is showing me to do within his word, what I'm receiving from him through prayer, and I'm walking it out. I'm set it sanctified, sanctification, sanctified to set myself apart. Set myself apart from who? From my selfish self. Set myself apart from who? The world system that would tell me to do otherwise, to be selfish. Set myself apart from the demonic activity, which is real and happens. Set myself apart from that to God, to the Bible, to the people of God, to the things of God. And I'm walking that out. So I've been justified, now I'm sanctified, and it's a continual process. And at first, if I have a sin in my life that has just been revealed to me and God is saying, you know what, Scott, there's, a, there's that sin in your life. I know you weren't really aware of it, but now that I'm renewing your mind, as Romans says, now you're starting to see it. And now that you're seeing the lights are coming on, I'm like, God, it's such a struggle. I'm glad that you may be aware of it, but it's such a struggle. I can't do this. I can't get rid of this sin in a day. It's going to take some time, even with your spirit. I'm so selfish yet. Please have mercy on me. I need to get this selfishness out of my system to get rid of this sin. Will you help me? And he's like, absolutely. He's not like absolutely. He is like, absolutely. Definitely. We're doing this. So we partner with God. And we start obeying with him and what he says. And then maybe months or weeks or maybe even days later, that sin is in the past. And we're walking it out. Sanctification, setting ourselves apart. Who you are today as a Christian should not be the same person you are six months from now. That's right. Does that make sense? Amen. That's right. Absolutely. And that is so difficult, right? Amen. It hurts. Because I'd like to be able to stand up here and say, I have it totally together. And, you know, as a pastor, I am hold doubly accountable for what's in this word. I am. Mm -hmm. And I need to be setting an example as according to Christ. So I need to have, I need to have everything in order. But look, I am human. And I am sinful. So we're all learning together. That's why I say pray for me. All that to say this, spirit-led. Church is a people who are spirit-led. I'm going to be perfect. It's like I said before. It's not the perfection in your life. It's the direction of your life. Philippians 1.6 says this, and I am sure of this. Let me encourage you. Folks, we're all struggling with sin in one area or another. Okay? And just because we're saved, just because we say we're struggling does not give us license to hold on to that like a like we're gonna coddle it and hold it as our best friend. Okay? But I know we do that. I do that. We're human, we do that. 
But Paul says this in his, in his word, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Be encouraged, church. Because there is coming a day where we're going to be made totally righteous. This is another word, glorification. We're going to see Jesus in glory. And on that day, we're going to be jumping around with him. We're going to be going with Miriam. Amen. <laughs> Oh, my glory. We're going to be going with our loved ones who believe in Jesus Christ, and we're going to have a good old time. Amen. Amazing. Church is a people who believe in and walk in the supernatural. Now, I want to be very careful with this. There are people that make the supernatural look really weird and chaotic, and it ought not be that way should not be that way. But I will tell you that I personally believe in the supernatural. I see it in his word and I've seen it personally in my life. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 21 says this, he is your praise and he is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. And Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. In other words, he, he accomplished the miraculous way back in the day, and he's accomplishing the miraculous today. And I believe that. And then 1 Corinthians says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 through, 20, through 31. It says this, that now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. And are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher <clears throat> gifts. Let me be very clear in all love. There are folks within the church, within the body, the whole body of Christ that are maybe Baptist, that are maybe whatever denomination it may be, Methodist, whoever, that do not believe that necessarily that God performs. And I'm not saying all Baptists, all Methodists believe or don't believe in this. I'm saying that there are a portion of people that do not believe that God would accomplish the miraculous today or that God operates through his people in different ways today. <laughs> and that's fine. But I, I look at this book and I read this book and I say God does amazing things. I've told you all about the, the miraculous healing in my life, in my heart where it was at 30% blockage in my heart and not due to medication, not due to the surgery that I had, nothing else. It went from 30% blockage in my heart down to zero. How did that happen within the span of a couple months? I don't know, but it happened. And then I go back and I say, oh, I do know, it's God. Mm -hmm. God did that. <clears throat> so I would say this, God still heals. A couple of stories about this. At a church that we went to in, uh, in Florida that we were a part of, a lady came up to the pastor and said, I am having so much trouble with my sinuses, and I just cannot get release from it. There's something wrong. Would you pray for me? Is that the end of the service? Would you pray for me? The pastor goes up to her and starts, puts his hands on her and starts praying for her. And then he has the thought, it comes to his mind and says, so-and-so, so-and-so, have you forgiven that person? And she was like, oh my gosh, like you've read my mail. And what it was, was the Holy Spirit telling this person, this woman, what had happened in her life. And apparently this woman had some kind of huge argument with this person, this other person, and had not forgiven him. Have you forgiven him? No, I haven't. Would you forgive this person today? And she did. And 
as soon as she got the words out of her mouth, I forgive, in Jesus' name, I forgive this person. At that point, the pastor said that he could physically hear the popping of her sinus cavities just going off. And all of her, her nasal passages were totally clear as soon as she said, I, I forgive this person. And she was healed at that point. Amazing. Sherry's grandfather, Grandpa Drake, story about that, there was a boy that was hit by a car early in his ministry. He went over on the side to the, to the, uh, to the boy. He's not breathing. There's no pulse in him. And he felt like God was prompting him in, in his spirit saying, if this were your boy, how would you want the pastor to pray? If there were another pastor up here and this were your boy, how would you want him to pray? And he automatically said, I want this boy healed. So immediately he started praying. The boy had breath in his body and started to have a pulse and was miraculously saved that day. Another person, I just talked to him yesterday, one of, the, one of Sherry's nephews who is now pursuing ministry, getting ready to plant a church within a year in sep next September. He was 17, 18 years old. He was on a mission trip to Nicaragua and there was an eight year old deaf girl that was in the worship service at that time <laughs> And he, being 17 or 18, he and others went up to that girl and started praying for her. And all of a sudden, she started jumping and dancing around and whatnot. And the pastor had to translate because they were speaking in Spanish. And Derek and his, his crew spoke in English. What's going on? He said, this girl has been deaf her whole life. And now as you guys put your hands on her, pray for her, she can now hear. Amazing stuff. I believe that God, and he says in his word, God gives prophetic words. Uh, I went to, to a, a service one time, and there was a pastor who at the very beginning of my Christian life, he prayed for me, and I had all this stuff and junk inside of my heart from my childhood, and he spoke directly about things that were going on in my heart that nobody else could have known, but God knew. And there was such a healing that happened that night. And I'm not a crier, but that night, I certainly did. I believe that God uses prophetic teaching of the word. When we're actually looking at the word and teaching the word, he uses that. And it's amazing how many people can come up to me and say, you know what, during that sermon, God had my number. It's like you were speaking directly to me. Well, that's his word. That's his spirit. And if, lest we forget, being born again is the most miraculous miracle of all. I'm saying this, is that being part of the church is being part of a body that believes in the supernatural can occur. I don't want to look for a demon behind every bush. I don't want to be chaotic. But at the same time, I don't want the church to stand in the way if God is going to be doing a miraculous thing. And I know this, that God sovereignly will do what he's going to do. And nobody can stand in his way. But what I'm saying is this is that I, I want to be available. If God is gonna use me to pray for somebody to get a healing, fantastic. If God is gonna use me to, uh, to go up to somebody and speak a word of encouragement, the very thing that they needed to hear, and I had no idea that they needed to hear that, I wanna be there to, do, to have that happen. And may I say this, that has not happened very frequently. And it's not like I go looking for stuff like that. But I'm telling you this, is that I believe from what I see in his word, that I believe that God still does healing, God still does miracles, God still speaks to us today. 
I don't know how, and I don't understand that totally, if I'm honest with you. But I know this, I want to serve him. If God does not still perform miracles, then why in the world are people being born again still? Mm -hmm. God is performing the miracles he does. And I know this too. If your loved one or your child is in dire straits, <clears throat> What are you going to ask God for? You're going to ask him for a miracle. God chooses to heal as he chooses to heal. He may choose to heal in different ways. He may not choose to heal and on a certain day at a certain time. He may not choose to do that. But it doesn't negate his healing power. It does not negate his speaking power. It does not negate his miraculous power to make the miraculous happen story after story after story of how the church has been used in miraculous ways by the Spirit of God under God's sovereign rule and hand is amazing. He loves us. This cross represents so much for us. There was a day when Jesus Christ walked this earth was born of a virgin, walked this earth perfectly, and died on this cross, bled for us, died for the sins of the world, was buried, and three days later, he rose again. And the miracle that I'm really looking for is that people may be born again, so that when they look to the cross, when they look to Jesus, that they would cry out to him and say, my sin is ever before me. I am under the wrath of a holy God. I need the ultimate healing. I need salvation. My hope and prayer is that if any miracle appears or happens, if there's no other miracles that happen of healing or anything like that, if no other miracle happens, I want to be the person that is directly involved with spreading the miraculous seed of the gospel. I want to be the one that is right there to experience another person being born again into the kingdom of God. I want to be that person that God uses. And I want us as a church, if, if for any other reason, just to be there under the obedience of Christ, to say, I will be that one who will go and be a part of that miracle if you'll use me. And there was a day that that happened that Jesus rose from the grave and lives forevermore. So that we look to him and we don't do religion anymore. But we look to him and we have a relationship with him. We ask him, forgive me for my heinous sin against a holy God. And God, I ask that you would forgive me. And he'll change your heart. Repent, turn away from who you were to who God is and who he wants you to be. So the church is so much. And you know what? Even though we've covered it in three sermons, there's no way to cover it totally. The rest of the story is going to be worked out in fear and trembling through us walking it out day by day. The Bible says to walk out your salvation in fear and trembling. And that's a healthy thing. The rest of the, the series is going to be definitely about the church. But I want us to know about the church. I know that some of you have probably not really ever experienced uh, the miraculous or healing or anything like that. And it's a little bit different to you. And there are plenty of scriptures that I could have used about the miraculous that God does in the New Testament. And that's okay. We are on a journey together. But I want us to understand that we need to value the word, worship Jesus, and understand who he is and live it out. That's what we need to be about as a church. God will fill in the gaps as we move along. Amen? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we come to you thanking you for your goodness. As we take communion now. We ask that you would be honored, glorified, in Jesus' name, amen.